Hello everyone, today we talk about Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden, since you asked me to appreciate his military qualities. As you know, the Swedish king is considered one of the greatest geniuses of military art, and I have already made uh, a video, uh, I think, about Swedish infantry, uh, both uh, um, at the time of Gustavus Adolphus, both the so-called colored regiments that were basically his... Uh, picked ones, uh, the professional troops and his conscripts, uh, as well as the mercenaries, and we will have to talk about Swedish cavalry and ar artillery as well. I think we made a video even about the uniforms and the uh, the banners, the the flags of the Swedish army at the time. Talk about uniforms because Gustavus Adolphus is also credited among the many other things. As we'll see now whether it's correct or not, but this is not really even the point in, in the for considering the appreciation of, of the man and of the commander. Um, because they started in part uh, exactly at this time. I mean, the creation of uh, some uh, accord, at least of a permanent professional. Uh, troops, army, and effective recruitment system that was already going on in Europe um, in other countries at the time, but that with Sweden uh, touched especially new in fact, uh, achievements in the military art that were there to stay, uh, arguably, as we will see, uh, up to this day. Right, at least uh, the military art is pretty much universal, but definitely in the history of civilization, the Swedish army of Gustavus Adolphus reached them first. Right, and as always, we have to understand the military accomplishments also under the light of the political and social background. Right, because uh, with reformers, military reformers in history, it's always the same story. Actually, historiography, the same Swedish historiography, has long recognized that. Despite Gustavus Adolphus, in fact, what surely one of the greatest commander in in modern uh, in modern history, um, didn't quite invent or come up or properly, uh, you know, it can be even credited with all the military uh, innovations that he brought, right? But this is in part relative, considering still that yes, you can have all of these things in the air. Um, by a certain degree, but putting them together and making them work in an effective way uh, to, you know, to, to an important degree of political and military success, because fundamentally Sweden with the, uh, as you know, for Gustavus, uh, I, spoiler, the, the story ends badly, right, you know, but with the end of the Thirty Years' War, the Sweden um, achieved, actually, uh, a lot, the status of a major power in Europe, essentially the, the Swedish Empire rose at, at that point, and what is, in fact, even more interesting is that at the beginning of the 17th century, um, the Swedish army was one of the most properly backwards in Europe, like they, in part, as it happens, the, the, the military reforms, that uh, Gustavus Adolphus is credited for, but also, you know, that especially from a political social point of view, uh, Oxesterna, the uh, Swedish Chancellor, is also importantly responsible, etc., were engineered, in fact, on, on a country that uh, hadn't up to that point stood at the fore of mill, except perhaps in naval engineering, because the Swedes in the 16th century were the first ones who at least began to design warships as such, right, from medieval times where essentially um, the, say, the, the military designs were still used practically even in the civilian transport, uh, etc. But Sweden was a modest power and the same, for example, the same conscript army and so this Swedish uh, core base made up of, you know, this important esprit de corps connected to the eight, uh, to, to, to the local Swedish provinces, um, you know, identity and, um, and uh, sense of commitment that was fueled importantly also with the religious ethos, as you know, uh, Gustavus Adolphus is considered one of the greatest champions of Protestantism, uh, is still considered, like in Sweden, like the, uh, the, the, the hero of the um, just of the country, many ways, and it's, uh, uh, that's a, a well, uh, you know, an accurate reputation considering his exploit, but also, in fact, of the 
of the Protestant cause in Germany during the war, uh, etc. And he is considered, in this sense, to have walked in the footsteps of Maurice of Nassau, uh, whose army we have already discussed uh, in that video. I have a modern warfare playlist. You have, you can easily find that. And there is perhaps. No, I think I haven't created a Dutch warfare playlist or anything, but I'm going to do it soon. And so, yet another great champion of, of Protestantism against uh, the um, Spanish Catholics, etc. And the Tercio that was dominating, as you know, up to, in fact, uh, battles like uh, Breitenfeld, just to mention the same, uh, basically, greatest accomplishment, tactically wise, of Gustavus Adolphus, uh, and later Rocroi, um, with the renewed French, um, you know, power, and in part, even there, as not necessarily up-to-dated models necessarily but in in ways that were, were showing un unavoidably the the change in, in modern warfare uh, it's considered like the the golden pair right of the great military modern military innovators and much of this fame uh, was due to this idea that we in fact discussed in, in the videos regarding the fact that uh, you know that this um, rulers um, the sovereigns, as a matter of fact, and commanders, who scored, in fact, an impressive set of victories, the same true for, for Gustavus and Maurice, etc. Um, and that surely uh, were extraordinary individuals, um, didn't actually engineer this dramatic um, change uh, in, uh, in a teleological sense. I mean, the, the reasons that brought the Dutch and the Swedes to victory against their opponents is, in fact, much more political and socially contingental than connected to any kind of things like, you know, they they read the classics like Elianus, the, the, the Roman legion, the, the Macedonian phalanx, and so they repristinated this great... No, this is a progressivistic, modernistic, technologistic bias that has nothing to do with any form of... Um, history of the military art uh, and that can be seen just as if you want a cultural uh, reflection of of an important development still of the renaissance the interest for the classics for the ancient greeks the romans etc the uh, so the necessity of the was felt in did to create a more you know professionally rec drilled and uh, uniformly armed uh, system um, etc that of course europeans at that time was were drawing from the past, but being fundamentally just uh, and already from from the Middle Ages, from late Middle Ages, especially in a in a more advanced uh, situation with very different um, tactical but also strategical problems. I mean, the the gunpowder brought an enormous deal. Like you can't compare. I don't know the the modern phalanx with I don't know the Macedonian one saying it's just the word pikemen they were different things they were working with different uh, tactical factors including in fact the shot um, as well as properly what that entailed from a strategical point of view not I don't know political social one think about logistics organization the, uh, the the weight of artillery we made videos explaining the incredibly slow but consistent uh, effort that the Europeans at that point put as states properly to to finance in an orderly, centrally, you know, directed fashion that only, in fact, a modern, modern reality could produce. Um, you know, a, a park of artillery worth of this name, right? Also, the military engineering capacity, uh, the Trace uh, Italienne before, then Vauban uh, later, etc. So, um, a very uh, new change. Um, Gustavus Adolphus and this represents really a milestone as we will see today uh, considering that he was avidly studied by by Montecuccoli by Napoleon by von Clausewitz so the greatest um, military commanders and, and, and theorists also of the uh, Napoleon relatively as a theorist but still you know his achievements compensate, I would say, overly abundantly, uh, the lack of, of that. Uh, but the, the we're seeing, in fact, um, as incredible results um, for the time. But they fit in a, in fact, in a context that is also one that 
we didn't really discuss in Farpunk, albeit I'm discreetly passionate about it, that is the aforementioned Thirty Years' War, 1618-1648, that um, I would say in many, even in the same Europe, uh, in some areas that especially were not, if not marginally, affected territorially by it, but in the world, in the West in general, right? Um, that is very far, in fact, from, from even from the culture, from the probably the Central European dimension uh, that was in many ways unique. We made uh, videos, especially about the 1683 siege of Vienna, looking at bit like the Austrian perspective today we talk about a northern European power actually more than a central European one but still um, a war that is I would this is in, in popular culture is distant right uh, a bit in the Anglosphere is distant in a sense even in certain parts of southern Europe it's distant also Eastern Europe didn't quite fit completely in that um, and uh, and so it's it, it's instead crucial as you know, if anything, for Westphalia, for all what is being discussed today, yeah, the pre-Westphalian war, the post-Westphalian war, all these things. I'd say, in any case, um, uh, I'm not a great fan of that subdivision, because in my opinion, um, it's, uh, it's too categorical, um, in a way. Uh, but uh, it's for the, the changes that it brought to Europe, and to Western thought, and to to Germany and to other countries that is uh, crucial to to understand even properly for the motivations of that when when people speak about the same Swedish intervention in the in the Thirty Years War well there, there is not a, a universal consensus about say a clear definition of the reasons even though I think it's much simpler than uh, than it is because in part we have forgotten in fact the spiritual dimension of warfare what it meant for a Protestant king like Gustavus Adolphus who was also dramatically involved way before the Thirty Years' War in, in continental affairs um, since you know his father disputes with uh, the, you know the, the kings of Poland did the, the various intervention in Germany worked with Denmark etc um, to participate in a struggle like the one of the Thirty Years War and naturally also the economical reasons Right, the fact is Sweden actually was was enriched by the war because it was a great uh, exporter of, of iron. And as you know, there was uh, an enormous, uh, even overproduction. At the end of the Thirty Years' War, they didn't really know how to do with all those weapons. They sold it to the Ottomans. Um, they, um, and, and, and naturally a more political, and kind of more, more evident reason that was uh, Richelieu, France, uh, desire, despite being a Catholic power, to intervene in Germany, given that the Habsburgs basically were winning, and the Swedes would would uh, reverse uh, the situation, as also the French would later. I mean, it was uh, the Third Years' War was essentially one of the greatest disasters in the history of mankind. Like one third of the German population was wiped out. Um, the plague broke out in Europe again. Uh, entire areas went went depopulated. It was a terrible mess and it was um, fueled especially at that time for the first half of the 17th century by this enormous uh, confessional ethos and uh, symbolism and struggle and force that was increasingly defined this modernizing and secularizing pre process at the end of the day uh, of emergence and definition of states and in fact we call eventually post-Westphalian as the idea that finally it's not you know like the idea of a uh, um, of a of a ruler that uh, let's say of a monarch that rules over different communities in language and religion etc. Now there is an ever greater subtle compaction and homogeneity so that you can't factually trace vus vu even just in fact from a military point of view in terms of permanent armies and their flags etc. Um, as opposed to you know think about Wallenstein the same one that defeated I mean that brought to to the same death of Gustavus, uh, eventually, that didn't stop the the, the Swedes, uh, as you know, they ravaged until you know they were in Bavaria at the time. It was a a mess, a, a total mess. In any case, um, this is the the background that surely makes you un clearly understand what were the opportunities 
for an emerging power like Sweden to get involved in continental affairs, they were paid a, an immense overload of money by France uh, to intervene. They imported, uh, because Sweden was, in fact, as I was saying before, not particularly advanced at all, Dutch artisans, technicians, etc., to, to refine the metallurgic industry for the guns, etc. In fact, that's where you connect the increased firepower also in Swedish armies because of this availability of, of moral material resources that were just, uh, if you want, an accident, a coincidence, right, an alignment of political, military, and social interests at the time that really explained why certain things even on the battlefield came to be, right? Even though, however, this had never, in fact, existed before in that, in that fashion. Um, so I think it's fair to say that Gustavus Adolphus was an exceptional innovator. Uh, even though we know, again, historiographically, that most of the things he was credited for, there is no proof he actually broke in the system, he was still the one in command of the army in, in the moment, right? It's like Marius. Everybody believes that Marius changed, I don't know, the Roman army, that the legionaries from one day to another changed, but nothing from a military point of view, totally nothing, not even a single thing changed because of that reform, not even one. It was a, a, a purely and exclusively political reform, everything was there before in the Roman army, it was already there, it didn't change anything. In many ways, uh, with Sweden it was the same, because in fact some of these innovations would, wouldn't actually supplant the older ones for a very long time, and even the silliest things that make you understand how you can't be so punctiformly obsessed with, I don't know, changing, switching from bandoliers to cartridge um, pouches. Right, the, the, the Swedes kept producing bandoliers for for ammunition up to the seventies of the seventeenth century. But uh, Gustavus Adolphus changed that. It's not true, as many other things that cannot properly be traced to him. And this is absolutely normal from a historical point of view. Um, great part, in fact, of this the, the mythology also of this the, this tactical engineering, uh, in, in a sense, was due to a lack of interest also historiographically towards other armies that were, in a sense, pioneering the same things. At least for Sweden, this is more concretely evident because um, Gustavus Adolfo's army brought things literally to a, to another stage. But for example, if you look at the Dutch. And in terms of the military innovations, tactically wise, first of all, it's very poorly explained. That they, in, in the simple fashion, it would just tell you like they would, they would thin the um, the infantry lines, increasing firepower, and that's it. But when you know somebody has to explain you what th they actually did on the field and how they actually fought, and I made a video instead to explain that thoroughly, that nobody really gives you the idea. So this uh, there is an obsession that is the almost the egomaniacally uh, deterministic uh, attitude of saying, you know, this was, you know, the, the great ruler, the great leader to change everything. That all the other peoples and, and, and armies and kind of were stupid because they didn't do it, right? This is basically a huge insult to history. It's not history of the military art whatsoever. And especially, these are just, have become s so evidently cliches in popular culture that are so easy to debunk because when you ask again how these armies actually fought, how let's say the Dutch fought, the English fought, the Spanish fought, nobody really tells you that point how they, what was the the real deal in the actual sense. So they have this pre-packed stereotypical notion of, of the main difference and then maybe they haven't even studied the sources of what happened on the field. Right? It seems like the Spanish were, were changing um, you know, or even even preceding the Dutch in in the you know tactical um, uh, innovations that I don't know an individual like Maurice of, of Nassau and his interaction is credited with. With his it, it it's something else a bit, and and we will see in part why, right? But still, again, all the various changes we can see were in the air. Nor Gustavus really did everything alone. Let ju just Sweden was already his ancestors. Um, were, had already started to change something, to modernize, to, to attempt, it, and it was an enormous. You see, the problem here was not again that that um, they wouldn't know how, what to do. The fact is that it costs money, and this is factually the 
the discriminant there. Uh, it's not a merely material thing, but you need enormous assets to make certain specific changes, right? And 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 when this, you know, you finally have them, which is a result, say, a product in in, in the competition of uh, of countries, so that are always trying to surpass one another, and so. Uh, it's just a race, right? The first one who comes up with that in a in a fully, you know, compact uh, synthesis that works is credited with ah, you know, it was this great science behind that. It wasn't quite that. It was just a combination of factors, um, and importantly enough, also the moral ones, like Sweden was in a sense not not really a young nation, but let's say if you look at the history of Europe, you realize that it, it's always like the the same idea that the, the most advanced air is gentrified earlier right and this newcomers later also are more spirited think about the lion of the north as as gustavus was famously nicknamed etc so again that that idea also that legion that mythology that however works also on the battlefield but it's a battlefield that is distant in, in time and mind also in history properly how history is made documentarily etc to to know exactly how it was, right? Uh, we have we were making a couple of months ago also. What was there a video about the Battle of Narva? Uh, you know, with Charles the Twelfth, a major battle, very important as you know in in the European balance of the time. Do we actually know precisely what happened that day? No, because just even it, it's um, you know, it, it's um, even a more peripheral context than than we think. So. What is actually important is to appreciate the caliber, not much of the guns per se, but as you will see, there was a, a great deal of Swedish standardization there, but the caliber of the men, right? What you can appreciate there is not much, whether, whether technique, etc. As we will see, even that tactic that was so successful at Narva, was it new in military art? No, it's always basically the same. It's just that the Swedish army at that point could perform it, was also lucky, was was very well commanded, was was drilled, was motivated. The Russians weren't in the same way. And still there was a risk for the Swedes to lose because were as you remember in a dire situation it was said was was a uh, an extra a shocking uh, shocking Russian defeat. Um so the same goes for Gustavus so that again today we will not make a biography of the man we could do at some point but still should be always understood because warfare cannot be studied epiphenomenally like just you know I just study the military stuff the rest I don't care equally you can't study just the politics or society you have to study the, the Clausewitz and try it all together um, so Gustavus and we will attribute him this broader achievement because he still was in command after all kind of changed dramatically the weapons and tactics of the period right he is also considered a very good strategist perhaps not excellent uh, but still very capable and his german campaign is really amazing um, in short he was one of the most complete commanders in military history there's no doubt in this uh, napoleon von clausewitz deemed him be so his campaigns were studied extensively so Gustavus essentially rearmed his infantry it was time in Europe where you know there were still a lot of archaic things on battlefields going on bird dishes used as you know um, support for for muskets were quite uh, encumbering uh, etc um, the same pikes right pikes were made more manageable in the Swedish army and reinforced uh, at the point with long and solid side strips so that cavalry saber sabers could not cut them. These were apparently very effective uh, against the same um, enemy cavalry, albeit, as we will see, uh, the, albeit the shock was coming back on the battlefields and actually it would be the Swedish cavalry to bring it back uh, to the fullest western battlefields there was in fact still the caracol around and the Swedes however had coped with the Polish cavalry that was an anachronism of success for which they Gustavus probably uh, 
uh, drew this intuition of the necessity of having a very strong charging uh, strongly charging cavalry back on, on the battlefields but again this is all to be understood still in the possibilities of of the <coughs> on the tactical possibility overall and it's still a combined arm tactics so you can't do really that with just cavalry, just infantry. It doesn't make any sense to consider them individually as if they were disconnected from the rest. Um, the pikes, seemingly also during the German campaign, this was observed um, at the time, were, were, were falling out of use, right? The heavily armored uh, pike men, uh, surely again, the uh, at least the first ranks, as you know, were heavily, heavily armored. The, the, the pikes were quite long and encumbering, were apparently thrown away during the march, also because it was very hard to really just walk with them. And the uh, simply, as we will see, the, the Swedish drill and tactical, uh, say, flexibility and maneuvering rapidity was enough, in a sense, to decrease, uh, to that point, the importance of the pike. Equally, and this is something, really, military history, Gustavus lightened the musket by practically halving its weight, right? Which is not really uh, about making it more performing in the process, but simply realizing that that firepower can be even reduced in a sense in, in the mere weapon individually, but to a greater benefit for the performance of, of the infantry in terms of speed, of deployability, etc., there are many instances, I know, look at the Franco-Prussian War of, you know, armies that had an edge on the other side because they could just reload more quickly, uh, and which was more important than, in, in practice, than even a range, the range of the weapon. Gustavus adopted, if not invented, the fixed loading cartridge with attached bullet. In this way, not only was the, the, the shot made faster, but it was also given a previously unknown ballistic uniformity. Again, this was required because, not because of the technological change in itself. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to think that. Um, it's, it's a rather, rather easy concept. In fact, it was already around. But the point is that at that point, there had not been, as we've just seen, even for the lightning on the musket to provide uh, infantry with that type of, of, of cartridge because the firepower was used in a different way. It was the Swedes now that just needed it because of uh, general reasons of, of training, professionalism, cohesion that, had, that could allow them per to perform certain maneuvers that were not needed before. At Breidenfeld, the Tertia was massacred, as you know, just because the the Swedes would do something that the Spanish at that point wouldn't do, that is, just move that rapidly, siding on the enemy flank and starting shooting volleys on them. Well, if they had been so, say, heavily equipped, like the standard musketeer at the time, they could have not even properly performed uh, that, that uh, maybe not the maneuver per se, but they would have not had the means to, to reverse, you know, at that distance, all that firepower on the enemy. Um, so, in this way, the Swedish troops were able to fire twice as fast as their opponents, which is a big deal and shows you how the uh, speed, uh, on, on the rapidity on the battlefields were, were, were intensified and the Swedes were there to exploit. Gustavus Adolphus was also the father of modern artillery, um, in the sense that he innovated it technologically, introducing the concept of mobile mass fire that had never had never been practiced before. Essentially, he reduced the weight and bulk over the over the artillery, reducing so a bit like in the muskets, as you see, reducing and rationalizing their calibers ju to just uh, three measures that could be 24, 12, or three ounces. Um, that is essentially the, the very light regimental guns that greatly facilitated logistical problems, right? And there was thus this um, this capacity of deploying artillery faster, even closer to the enemy, 
uh, because also these pieces costed less, as you understand, or at least there were, there were also made, there were important technological improvements as well. This was not just a size reduction, right? It was also an, a qualitative improvement of the material. As we've seen, the Swedish steel was a big deal. Uh, already at the time, the Swedes uh, exported and uh, the, the, the raw material and imported technicians. Uh, as you know, the Swedish iron w w would be very important also for fueling the, the British Industrial Revolution later on. Uh, these are important things. And the standardization too, because the standardization allows essentially to fire more uniformly, to maintain more easily uh, the same rate of fire and therefore concentrating fires, we will see how it was done also properly in the volleys, to shatter more effectively the enemy. In fact, artillery definitely became the main mean of destruction on the battlefield, uh, in many cases decisive for its final outcome. Not that artillery was and would uh, be the, the main killer on the battlefields. From this intuition to come, you know that in the, in the 18th century also mobile artillery would become generalized in, uh, in um, European armies, etc. But it wasn't the main killer. The point of artillery was disrupting the for the enemy formation from a psychological point of view. That's also why they shot, for example, ricochet because there was not much about making the um, the ball landing on you know in the full of the, in the midst of, of of the of the formation. They wanted essentially to make freak out the the first. Um, uh, soldiers of the file that were also the ones that the rest, uh, in fact, followed by uh, by default by just uh, you know looking at the, the ball bouncing in front of them, uh, literally s having even time to 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 change position to to disrupt the the ranks before the ball arrived and cut some black, um, and that would disrupt overall the same uh, you know the same formation that had I massive psychological. Uh, effects um, as well. So in tactics, Gustavus Adolphus reworked and fundamentally brought to the full maturity the precepts that had already been studied by Maurice of Nassau, and there is a Swedish originality, in fact, in the type of it. Um, Gustavus practically found the best way to implement combined arms tactics in the age of the pike and, and, and shot. Uh, in a sense beginning its its demise on the longer run, because as you know during the second half of the 17th century that would have incrementally uh, decreased um, to a point of you know relative uh, uh, in fact importance and the same Swedish German campaign it was very quick and but this is showed also in the English Civil War later uh, where you know, were a lot of hedges, etc., and where the pikes, the, the the big blocks, like like the tertio squares, could not quite operate in the, the same way, and the the agility, the mobility, of the of the single musketeer and his firepower is more important than the linearity, the compactness, the cohesion of of these masses of pike that were ever more uh, vulnerable to to firepower. By the way, um, and uh, and this problem of you know perfectly balancing ideally pike and shot had been the problem of pike and shot warfare since from from the beginning to the end right you you have 200 years uh, or more actually uh, before you know the the, uh, the pike disappeared on the battlefields for, since the, the the shot was introduced that makes you see also how there was nothing apps you know by any stretch of the imagination re revolutionary like you know all the bullshit of the military revolution and people st still keep buying like fireworks oh wow the military revolution it was no military revolution in the rest just just to make it very clear um and explained also elsewhere specifically why um had been studied thoroughly intensely Right. That's also why, in many ways, those um, classical studies of these leaders were somewhat also just theoretical. Right? They had been in the Middle Ages. The reality was different. Right? What was really intensified was the importance of drill, um, standardization, uniformity, the field, the, the standardization even properly of the field fortifications. Today we don't even talk about 
in general, military, I mean, um, siege engineering, things like that, the problem of, of the fortress, of, of the guns. But these were times of great uh, improvement. In fact, Gustavus was impressed by, you know, knowing what, you know, the other ach the achievements in Western warfare abroad had been, right? He, uh, he was amazed by that and thought the Sweden had necessarily to, to, to bridge that gap and in order to exploit the, the a, as it would under him the, all the main opportunities that were presenting s itself politically and militarily uh, abroad. Um, the high rate of fire of Gustavus Adolphus musketeers and above all the invention of the of the gun salvo by which the line of musketeers simultaneously unloaded their shots on the target caused in the enemies not only losses but also a dangerous disorganization. So defined in English as salvo, salvi, volley, fire, well uh, this is a, a firing technique as you know by which an entire unit simultaneously unloads the fire of its weapons on the enemy. This is crucial because um, this is an important example. Imagine you have the same amount of troops that can sh uh, shoot against the same enemy. Let's say all the shots, like say 60 men, can shoot all at once in one second, or they can shoot the same amount of fire, say by with one shot um, a second, right? To to fire in, in in one minute the same amount again of fire, but just the difference between diluting it in all the minute or concentrated in one second, right? So you shoot the same amount of bullets, right? You, you hit the same amount of enemies. So the physical damage is actually the same, is identical. But the psychological one, given that war is primarily a matter of moral forces, not material ones, in the case of the fire concentrated in one second, is devastating in comparison to the diluted a shot in in the same amount of time right because in that single moment you unload such a volume of fire that the disruption that can be partially you know uh, mentally and physically compensated if you know the fire is more diluted at that time is disrupting the entire order same formation it it lowers the morale of the enemy unit enormously makes it sink at that point and it's at that point, and that's where combined arms come into play, that you can, say, maybe launch your cavalry charge, because the enemy is at the minimum of moral resistance and of physical order, and so you can more easily at that point exploit that, um, that weakness. So, Gustavus Adolphus Swedes were the first to practice the, uh, the, the, the gun salvo by closing the six infantry ranks that were habitually employed at the time, making them three, right? So, um, the, 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 you have seen it probably often, in just even in movies at point. The first rank knelt down, the third pointed their, right, uh, their, their guns into the openings of the second, and then at the order, the wall formation fired at the same time. And this had considerable practical effects. First of all, it should be remembered that until the adoption of Cordite in 1892, the battlefields were obscured, literally after a few minutes of fire, by the smoke of gunpowder. So the salvo allowed the smoke to clear at least a little between one shot and the other, allowing better visibility on the next shot. That is to say, uh, in, the, in the first moment, you know, where the air is kind of clear. Uh, the 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 precision, the accuracy is is intensified because everybody effectively can't see more or less where they can sh when they shoot, right? Whereas if you start shooting, even if a few guys still you know there's the smoke all around, you can't quite see well. So even about this, were the Swedes more intelligent and the other people more stupid that they didn't find out this thing? No, this has to do again with the doctrine, that is to say. Uh, given the higher drill, this uh, higher improvements in the firearm technology, uh, this uh, greater drive 
produced even just by the the commander, the, the charisma, the the background of these people, whatever, would allow them to rely more on the shot. And as such, they uh, since they they actually would have been a disadvantage in pikes, right? In hand to hand fighting on foot at least, the um, the better way was to um, uh, increase firepower, and this would uh, happen by thinning the line and actually make uh, in depth and making it wider, so you could use more of these people at a time firing, creating a, a longer line of fire, as we've seen at this point is specializing in this concentrated fire because it's the best way as we've seen they could shoot half time the same enemy speed because that was their best defense right and they could simply move more easily the formation all around and exploit the uh, more conventional kind of static uh, nature of the, the enemy infantry formations were still more about bikes rather than than, than shot Furthermore, um, consider that muskets were not all, uh, at all accurate at this point. It was said that if you were targeted by an arquebus over 150 meters, you were as safe as in a cathedral. By the way, there is all the question, arquebus targeting were muskets at this point? Well, you would be surprised how many arquebuses there were still in the field. And still, the fact that um, these pieces were not standardized. I mean, it's not easy to understand, not even from the source, but even sometimes in the technical pieces, what was an archipus, what was a musk, right? There were, there were all kinds of adapt adaptations, uh, experimentations, etc. But still, overall, uh, the, um, you know, the, the actual performance of the individual gun was ridiculous. So the enemy was seriously damaged, um, even if only for the calculation of probabilities, by shooting him at a short distance, first of all, preferably below 100 meters, and with a coordinated firing of units, or the effect on him would have been practically nil. And this is also the point, right? Increase the, um, the amount of shot, um, the, the line of fire, the, the capacity, the proximity. So you just an inch that shot from from the pike uh, in order to maximize that effect and again it was a very gradual uh, process because still the pike was effective right so w whether you know you, you you took away from somewhere you had to compensate on another right just uh, it was the professionalism the drill and so ultimately the collective training as always that made the difference very often over other systems that however yes had kind of lagged behind because they had remained let's say more fixed on a on a say more conventional and somewhat just good enough um, considering the expanses um, type of tactic organization this is important uh, when you look at the differences between the German or Spanish warfare compared say to the French one or in fact to the Dutch or the Swedish one because uh, the Thirty Years' War, here the Swedes had uh, a jewel of an army, right? It was compact, but it was very, as we'll say, well-financed, right? So they could even properly afford the means to carry out these tactics. Uh, the, the, the German armies that fought most of the times were just uh, coming from exhausted um, politically and socially exhausted uh, also military exhausted realities with much greater needs even there of say greater mobil strategic mobility as opposed to tactical effectiveness um, as always war is always is fought in precarious conditions right so in this sense the Swedes were advantaged by their background French money this important you know uh, in, in you know metallurgic industry that were developing uh, and also the capacity of exploiting this sensibly weakened system like Germany was massive and you know open for uh, you know vulnerable to, to, to invasion as the saying of Saus Adolfus proved right so the way of war say of the Germans of the Spanish was in, in this doctrinal sense more relaxed also because that was the only the only way at that point they had to make war, they also had their improvement during the war naturally. Um, 
So the moral effect, the losses and the disorder caused by the Swedish gun volley stopped the opponent. Pikemen that were present still in the Swedish army took advantage of it by rushing on with their pikes lowered and also having made the pikes shorter in this sense was you know more functional to a closer range fight in that sense it was counting on exploiting an already disrupted um, pike square formation that therefore would allow some some gaps and kind of reduce even the necessity of all that pike length and even if the pikemen attack did not break through the musketeers in the meanwhile had time to reload to fire a new salvo of cover for example in preparation for a new attack by the pikemen and so on blow by blow until the opponent disintegrated and everybody knows by studying the 30 years war what kind of utter bats of blood these battles were right a constant pounding um back and forth it was an attritional system right the the entire thing at, at that point is you know the uh, as long as the pike because this was the, the the logic of pike and shot as long as the pike could factually arrive uh, to the shot crossing the battlefield the pike was useful because the shot was inferior in, in melee right and so it worked up to the beginning of the 18th century where pikes on the battlefield were the, i mean not emergentially they would be even later even during the french revolution you find i don't know pikemen and such but say doctrinally things at least had changed already by that point um so the cooperation between musketeers and pikemen in mixed units had two centuries of life but Gustavus Adolphus perfected it to this important uh, stage towards the end of itself with the diamond or T-shaped deployment with which real corridors of fire were built right protected by formations of pikemen which cross um, shooting at the enemy from multiple directions uh, and this could be done by alternating literally even the lines that were firing the Dutch for example were inventing some sort of of ballet literally because they they took it after a local dance that they would just be deployed in the rear of the pikes and kind of um, run pirouetting in between the this uh, say in these corridors and shoot and then they would, uh, you know, go to the side, and the thing would continue like that by creating, for example, a continuous fire. So, as you understand, there um, also the this idea of the volley, etc., it was being uh, say it was not standard. Every battle was different. Every unit was habituated in different ways. The training standards, the equipment standards, were all changing depending on the situation. The change in the cavalry was very important. Um, Swedish cavalry essentially ab was the first one to abandon the caracol. Uh, not completely, because they still had uh, mounted gunners, pistoliers, etc. Uh, the, the typology of units were all the same. It's the balance, the, the shifts in favor of properly of decharge and cold steel um, the caracol as you know was a maneuver with which the the horsemen took turns um, firing guns um, because this had essentially been the only th thing they could do while the pikes had uh, s surpassed the cavalry the infantry in mid 15th century had presented itself with these blocks that the cavalry couldn't really charge into because there were thousands of men so Cavalry had specialized in this um, arriving to the, you know, the fore of the enemy, shooting with a pistol and repeating the caracol, this alternation of the ranks, like, a, in fact, uh, a rank fire. And then actually cavalry would still charge in the pikes at the end. They would throw even their pistols against the, uh, the enemy, even if they cost it a lot, by the way, and hopefully break through. So... The idea that charges had stopped at some point in the mid 16th century, it's false. Cavalry always charged in every single battle. 
right? It's just that the preferred preliminary phase that as we've seen attritionally could last very long entailed this idea of, of the uh, of, of cavalry being specialized in this kind of skirmishing tactic that was eventually aimed at closing in if you know the enemy infantry had been uh, softened up enough um, the uh, the Gustavus Adolphus properly reintroduced the, the free reign chart in, in a sense, right? Never, never free reign because, of course, free reign is, is dangerous if not, you know, for the uh, unit's cohesion. But in the last 100 meters, they, they would also consider the properly psychologically one event at that point, right? You could just go for it. It's like those guys in the trenches that were, were the first that preferred the moment of the attack than the waiting, right? Preferring to die rather than to live in that atrocious expectation. Of, of the end, rather. And this, coming back to Cold Steel, um, was an innovation that caused a, a, a real upheaval on Western battlefields, bringing back in uh, Oj the units, uh, let's say, probably the shock charge. Um, this, as we've seen, was possible because firepower as we were saying before, uh, w was capable of depressing the enemy to, to the point that uh, temper the potential, the pike potential was also kind of useless and the cavalry could simply finally have enough power to just smash into it on a more regular, uh, on, on the enemy infantry on a more regular basis. Um, Gustavus Adolphus had been able to personally evaluate the effectiveness of Polish cavalry in his wars against the, Confe uh, the Confederacy, which um, had never abandoned the tradition of cavalry charge, even with the spear, even um, after the pike and the harquebus had advised the most prudent tactic of the caracol, right? Polish heavy cavalry, the Slakta, was also properly maintained in part. The spears were produced by the state because it, it was a major asset. Essentially, by the end of the, of the Middle Ages, Polish armies were identical to the Western ones. But um, when in the 16th century they properly consolidated the um, the, the confederal unit, they, the, the Polish frontiers expanded dramatically in, in Eastern Europe. And so their cavalry was already kind of normal. And... Uh, the Polish had even just even for strategical reasons to to cope with this various enemies at once they reevaluated the importance of heavy you know heavy cavalry in that more functional uh, Lancer way um, it's not that the Polish cavalry would literally charge into the um, enemy uh, pike pike square on a regular basis but still it had a massive a shock capacity that at some point could do this. I mean, so, so the same Polish uh, lances were even longer than than the Western pikes at a point, so that would give some edge even in that regard. But just to tell you how messed up this is, um, the Swedes, you know, were, you know, they they tested Polish cavalry effectiveness on the field. But there are there is an account even from a Polish nobleman because these were also old professionals, right? So they were really tough, heavy cavalry. That said that the Swedes had, for example, created a smaller, um, a shorter pike that was extremely useful against Polish cavalry. And he was amazed that he, they would never use it again. So there you see even just why it's a shorter pike. Why, why would it have to be effective? Because we, and why would this guy say that? Right? He probably had seen something there. He wasn't just talking for the sake of it. Well, so this tells you that technology per se is not like dimensions performances per se individually with weapon are not what counts in, in warfare. It's virtually insignificant, right? It's, it, the doctrine is everything, right? And so, even at least in some encounter, there had been some changes, some innovations, some coming back, so things that even intuitively do not seem to make sense, but still, maybe in that encounter, it had. Because armies are not all alike. No army is alike to another, no commander is alike to another, no tactic. Uh, not no battle properly is uh, equal to another, right? So you may never know. But surely this Polish influence in the revival of uh, Swedish cavalry uh, uh, shock charge capacity is uh, is there.
Gustavus Adolphus properly reevaluated the importance of the cavalry collision and uh, to compensate for its lack of fire potential because now the horsemen uh, were in fact uh, less um, you know it's the inverse dynamic that happened in infantry. Infantry increases firepower. Now that Swedish cavalry was decreasing firepower that was normal as the horsemen habitually unloaded their guns while charging the enemy to hold, to hold eventually the, the saber. Um, um, Gustavus had these squadrons accompanied by special detachment of musketeers, so increasing that cooperation between the various arms that at some point included also artillery. Right, this would be apparently a, a Swedish, an important Swedish um, uh, specialty that also later on was quite appreciated uh, in the Great Northern War, etc. The idea properly of having uh, a maneuverable artillery that you could um, screen at some point with, with cavalry itself and when you know the gaps opened it could fire and using it essentially also together with the musketeers etc so very very flexible dynamic tactics that could have been possible only with the degree of cohesion and training and professionalism of the Swedish army then part also was not even made up by Swedes by, but by foreign mercenaries for example um, so again professionalism the same goes for the Dutch basically the entire Dutch army was mercenaries Right? It was not about who they were, but the fact that they were professionals and make all the difference. Because they were more drilled, they had more collective training, so they were better than other formations. That's it. Even if maybe the other formations were individually tougher. Uh, I don't know, the, 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 the Russians still used feudal cavalry with the lanks and the page and all this thing. I don't know, maybe individually they were even greater. But in terms of collective capacity, they sucked in comparison to these innovations. Um, but also Western armies at this point were kind of all a bit similar, right? The differences that were just taking shape were barely appreciable. And perhaps the Swedish army of uh, Gustavus Adolfo is, is, is so praised exactly because it was the one where it was the one where this kind of more evident at the time was mostly praised for in, in difference compared to the others. Um, so um, there was also... A, um, um, in part a, a, a decrease in cavalry man maneuverability by a certain degree because um, cavalry was ever more specialized in in the charge right and was also getting heavier by a certain degree and lacking this firepower as we've seen the musketeers were to compensate um, for it, but and and this made cavalry less maneuverable, if anything, because it had to be more attached to infantry to be effective, right? But again, you know, you see, if if that cavalry actually was probably even more maneuverable than what the others were, because if you are habituated in hand to hand, to, trained into hand to hand combat, generally speaking, you are at least you're going more for it, right? As a skirmisher, as a caracoler, you can. Uh, surely you're speedy and you know how to get yourself out of the way quickly because you don't want to close in even if they would do it any anyhow uh, at a point um, but you don't want to really attack in fact the guy was going to, to cut your throat as his first specialty right but again if if you are in fact designed to retreat and to make this kind of party and shot like with a gun and this cavalry is just staying there maybe also bit more loaded in armor for that matter to, to protect itself from the shots well uh, you know the, 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 there are less things that that cavalry can do it can pursue you but up to where up to where so it, it was better to remain stuck to the to the musketeers and so that's where the loss in maneuverability not because it was would have been less maneuverable as a form of cavalry in general it's it's because it lacked the complement of firepower for which they were to be depending now on, on the cooperation with the infantry that however seemingly made it more effective as a, as a couple than the the average caracol or even another uh, let's say uh, heavy cavalrymen uh, that would normally charge so 
on the battlefield, the combined arm system created, uh, say, maximized the strength of each type of, of troop, compensating for their defects and optimizing the overall synergy of the war device. And so all these changes make sense only in the synthesis of it, in the cooperation between the various arms. So a truly admirable mechanism indeed by which the Swedes could face and win enemies much larger in number and also in strategic advantage. This is why Gustavus Adolphus that led this army in, in several tens of battles um, in, against many enemies, many terrains, many, many situations operationally, is considered a precursor of modern warfare because uh, he, in a sense, invented linear tactics. Right, uh, the the shot would have maintained that kind of of importance, uh, and uh, it would remain practically unchanged until the First World War. But even today, in the atomic age, Gustavus Adolphus intuitions are perpetually fixed in military art. Um, perhaps, as we we're saying before, he was a little less skilled as a strategist, but he was still a great commander, really one of the great uh, commanders in history, and definitely one of the greatest in the modern age, easily. Um, and he was also great in misfortune, because he died, um, we don't know whether, some say he was killed by friendly fire, famously, you know, the, the Battle of, of Lutzen in 1632, um, and some say he was killed by mistake by his own troops, he was probably actually shot. Um, by the enemy. He, he had already been shot once by a Polish soldier through the shoulder, which had essentially paralyzed two of his uh, fingers. And from there on, he could have, uh, he could not, uh, could have, could not wear any more um, a cuirass, right? So he went on with this padded uh, armor that was quite common at the time. The Swedes used uh, moose skin. They found uh, th those animals in the north, and and so the story s says he, you know, he was first wounded and, and started roaming uh, around the battlefield. Then he uh, in, and dispersed. Right by the way, the Swedish wing was even successful, but when the king disappeared, said, "What the hell?" They stopped, and he began to roam around, and eventually he was shot again and stabbed. And then apparently when he was on the ground, he was shot in the head at the temple by a, by a pistol. And um, so this was the end of the Lion of the North that was a pretty, as you understand, tragic one. Also considering that uh, a complete success of Gustavus had he remained alive would have projected him also as a political figure further, right? Sweden would have surely benefited for uh, from from that important because he knew how to move himself uh, in international scenario would have accumulated a greater power and fame and importance um, in any case this is pretty much the the concept the idea we will keep talking about the Swedish army at the time of Gustavus Adolphus also in previous and later times because frankly um, that's quite interesting, also during the 16th century or the, even the second half of the 17th. But um, it's, uh, in fact, without studying the army organization, uh, the, the single battles, etc., you, you can't fully picture practically what, what we're talking about. All this sounds good in, in theory as a as a comprehensive model, but then the military practice is always different, very different, right? So um, these are times and places that should be studied more, in my opinion, uh, and that's why at some point I also want to increase the the amount of modern warfare videos because I think we never made a video about the Thirty Years' War. Yeah, we talk about Wallenstein, but you know it was just a side um, 
video about the, the historical character and his background and you know his uh, you know alchemic astrological and uh, obsessions but next to the to the general and to the quasi emperor of Germany <laughs> at some point um, but again these are really to ye others I mean there's some of greatest um, commanders of the time Spinola, eventually Montecuccoli. Montecuccoli was captured by the Swedes during the Thirty Years' War, and he was prisoner in, St in Strasbourg on the Baltic, and that's where he began to write also his famous treaty. And I made a bit about him as the milestone in military uh, Western military thinking between Machiavelli and von Clausewitz. And so you can argue that uh, the Swedish experience, both on, on uh, especially on the battlefield, had skilled the imperial, uh, the imperial marshal would, would also essentially spare Vienna for you know twenty years in advance of, uh, of the 1683 siege with the Battle of Saint Gothard, and when, in fact, the the volley, the orderly volley of the imperial army against the Ottomans on the ramp was really a masterpiece, right of that case also of command of charisma of Montecuccoli, but also these new intuitions that he surely had gotten in part from the even the Swedish example um, back in the in that carnage that the sheer carnage that the Thirty Years' War was. Um, in any case, for today I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like. Or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.